Welcome back to UC Davis Live COVID-19. I'm Soterius Johnson. Today, we're talking about how the way we design and run buildings can affect our health, including the spread of the new coronavirus. The World Health Organization maintains the two most common routes of transmission are by respiratory droplets from sneezing, talking, or even just breathing, and by touching contaminated surfaces and then touching the nose, eyes, or mouth. But the WHO recently updated their guidance to include the possibility of airborne transmission of the virus as well. Just before they made that change, more than 200 scientists signed on and signed on to an open letter uh, warning about the possible uh, possibility of airborne transmission of the virus, much smaller particles that can linger in the air for much longer than droplets. So what makes for a healthy indoor environment? What can we do to make buildings safer? Will the pandemic have a long-term effect on how we design places of work and where we live and how we play? Um, here to help us get answers to some of those questions are David Coyle. He's a project scientist working at the UC Davis Genome Center. He manages research collaborations and supervises undergraduate research in microbiology. And um, welcome to us uh, today, David. If you could turn on your, your video camera there. Thanks. Thanks Excellent. for having me. And Kevin Vanden Weimellenberg is an associate professor at the University of Oregon and co-director of the Biology and Built Environment Center. Thank you for joining us today as well. Happy to be here. So we are taking audience questions. If you are watching us live right now, just leave them in the comments section and we will work in as many as we can. So David, uh, let's start with you. Many of us know that people have microbiomes, uh, these communities of microorganisms that live within us. Well, it turns out buildings and cars, pretty much anything that can be described as a built environment also have their own microbiomes. What do we mean by the microbiology of the built environment? Yeah, so we just mean, as you just said, the collection of microbes that's found in any human constructed environment that could be transportation, homes, offices, you name it. And, and what we see in those environments is that there's a mix of microbes that have come from humans and come from the outside environment. Imagine a hospital, most of the microbes come from humans. Imagine a home where the windows are open, pets come in and out, you have many more microbes from outside. But in total, you get distinct microbial signatures inside of buildings that are very different than the outside environment. And I would expect like different buildings have their own individual microbiomes and much like people do? Absolutely, and that depends on a lot of factors. It depends on geography. It depends on how the building is run and how it's designed and also what the building is used for, how much people come in and out, whether the windows open, et cetera. When we're talking about you know, indoor environments, are these microbes mostly coming from humans or are they also just coming from the outside environment as well? I mean, it really depends. If you take the extreme case, we did some work on the International Space Station. There, everything that you find came from people because everything else is sterilized and it's a bad idea to open the windows. <laughs> um, but in uh, a hut somewhere with open sides, much of what you see represents the environment. So it really depends on how open the building is to the outside environment. So what role do microbes that live in buildings, what role do they play in our health? Well, I would say one of the big ones is this, what's called the hygiene hypothesis, the idea that you're exposed to a variety of microbes when you're young and that helps tolerate your immune system. And there's good evidence that the microbes in a home influence your risk at developing asthma or other autoimmune disorders. And that's correlated with pets, probably because pets bring in a lot more microbes from the exterior than, than a pet-free home. The other way that microbes can interact with health, of course, is, is pathogens. If you imagine a place like a hospital where you spend a lot of time sterilizing the place, killing everything, and then you bring lots of sick people in, the microbes that you find in those spaces tend to be the ones that you worry most about, and those can actually present a risk to people. Well, speaking of that, um, what's the latest on what we know about how long the new coronavirus remains viable on certain surfaces? I mean, there was a talk where they were saying um, the latest that we knew is that it lived longer on or remained viable longer on, say, stainless steel services as opposed to others. What's the latest? So surprisingly, there isn't really a latest. Like, I, I've been kind of shocked at how little 
new data is being generated on that very question. There was one study in March, which is what every news report since has referred to, looking at it on cardboard, on stainless steel or whatever. And there hasn't been a lot of follow-up work to that, which is kind of surprising to me. And I think this is one of the big questions. There's been a lot of studies in different environments where they look for the RNA from the virus, but that doesn't tell you that the virus that they found was actually alive or, or viable in those environments. It just tells you that the RNA persisted. So I think that's one of the really big, important questions about this coronavirus. Is there any detectable pattern of spread of the virus within buildings or among buildings? I would let Kevin speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kevin. Sure. Well, I think it's important to, to state at the beginning and perhaps more than once throughout the program, we are going to talk about the word virus, but there's a distinction with the word virus and viral genetic material or RNA. So I think trying to, trying to keep that clear when we're talking, because a lot of, as David mentioned, a lot of the research that we've been doing and others that we've been reading is really tracing the RNA, which is um, a, a it's it's genetic material it's an indicator that the virus was there and that we it's difficult to know whether that's potentially still infective or viable uh viral matter um but we have been doing extensive sampling in built environments we've been in uh, over a thousand samples in different hospital locations we've done uh, hundreds and hundreds of samples on uh, in university buildings and through collaborators, um, another several thousand samples at uh, various senior care centers with a, a local company here called EnviroTech in Eugene that we've been collaborating with. And so through all of that work, we've been starting to understand more about the modes of spatial transmission. And so, and this is really built upon a platform of a decade of research funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, where we, we looked at other microbes and how they moved around buildings um, and so we can look at some similarities and maybe some differences from what we've seen uh, from that previous work. With this, because it's an infectious pathogen, we've, we've taken even a, a closer look at those modes of transmission. And so I'm happy to unpack a little bit about what we've been learning in those spaces um, from senior care, uh, to, to healthcare and even HVAC systems. Sure, so what, have, what, what, have you, what are you learning? What are the early uh, indications? Yeah, so I think the big question that I, that I had when we started, I think a lot of us had when we started this work back in March was what is the air, aerosol or airborne risk? You know, basically um, the viral particles are, are impossibly small to imagine. However, they are always caught up in other, you know, uh, other other droplet nuclei so other uh, human matter when you when you cough when you sneeze when you breathe um, the individual viruses are going to always be caught up in this other um, wet matter and it may be very very small and and fine and, and remain aerosolized for hours um, or it may fall to the ground nearly immediately and it's visible right and everything and in between and so we started by looking at um, three different sampling techniques. Surface swabs, uh, where we walk around with these glorified Q-tips or flock swabs and we collect samples. What that provides is an integration of a long period of time. Ever since that surface had been physically decontaminated with, you know, with uh, biomass removal, like yeah. washing the surface with a cloth or a mop, uh, you'll have a signal of whatever might have settled there since or been brought there by a human. Uh, and then there's what we call passive settling plates. These are just Petri dishes or little plastic dishes that are sterilized and you open them and you set them out for a period of time. And then you know what has settled into that plate over that known duration. Maybe you set it out for two hours or 24 hours. Um, and there's always a possibility that something was resuspended, which is to say it had already settled on a surface. Then somebody walked by and you know, kicked the dust up, if you will, and then it settled back into the dish. So that's possible. Uh, and then the third technique is through air sampling, active air sampling. And so that's using a, a filter, uh, filter paper or a liquid impinger and, an, and a pump, just an air pump, like you might hear your fish tank air pump. Uh, and, it, and it's bringing air through and, and collecting sample that way. So by pulling 
any of these spaces apart with those three different sampling techniques, you can start to understand what may have been there longer term, how it differs from what's in a fresh settled dish and how that's different from what's in the air. And so very specifically, we're sampling for coronavirus and we're starting to learn that, okay, we are finding viable, well, excuse me, we are finding RNA or the trace of the virus in the air. And this is where you have to potentially allow yourself a little bit of freedom in thinking and hypothesizing as a scientist where WHO doesn't have that luxury. They need to base everything on really hard and well-evidenced research. So with that said, we, we pretty quickly saw traces of the RNA in passive, passive settling plates and in active air pumps. And of course, we're in rooms where we know there are active emitters, people who are sick. Um, and so that has led us to do this research where we're sampling inside of air handlers. And we just published that preprint pre -print a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we have identified, again, the RNA um, at various stages in the air handler. Right. Um, are you searching, when you're doing these studies, are you actually able to search for viable virus as well as the RNA, or is it really just the RNA that you're looking for? So with a collaboration with David, we are working on that. Um, right now, the preprints and the work that we've uh, got in for submission is all about presence and abundance. And so presence and abundance does not tell you whether it's infective. I'll, I'll let David talk a little bit about our work um, in collaboration on viability, but I'd love to come back at some point and just talk about what can we really learn just with presence and abundance. Mm -hmm. And I think we can still learn some useful things. So, so re regarding viability, uh, to determine whether a virus like coronavirus is infectious, you have to grow it in cells in tissue culture cells and you have to do that under very stringent biosafety considerations and so the facilities that are capable of doing that are very limited and they're spending a lot of their bandwidth on things like vaccine development and animal model trials and, and all those things that need to happen so that's the reason why we have to use rna as a proxy because it's actually very difficult to measure the infectivity of the virus we're actually doing sampling now at the uc davis medical center around the medical center where we're going to do that kind of culturing in parallel with the RNA work and hopefully get a better handle on, on viability of virus in those environments. But what Kevin is referring to is we're doing an experiment right now. In fact, just yesterday, I shipped samples from our lab to his lab uh, where we're looking at a way to tell if the virus was viable without having to culture it. And I don't know whether that experiment will work, but if it is, that would be really huge because it would allow us to ask these same questions of air sampling, whatever, and get a sense of the viability of the virus. So, so hopefully we're working on that, but um, we don't know yet. That's great. We do have a question um, from Michael, who's watching on Twitter. Is the RNA alone enough to make someone sick? I'm gonna guess that the answer is no. Uh, no. Yeah, okay. you need you need you need a, an intact virion that can can enter a cell. Right, Kevin. Do you want to talk a little bit about you know what we can learn from just being able to discover where the RNA is? Yeah. So we've been exploring that because of all the limitations and access to these you know higher biosafety level labs that David mentioned. We're trying to do the best we can with the tools that are that are just easy at our disposal. And there's a lot that we can accomplish with the presence and abundance of the RNA. So we'll never be able to say with absolute assuredness whether anything that we've sampled is viable and therefore you know, potentially infective. And science is also on a quest to learn what is the minimum effect infective dose. Uh, with all of that said, I would still say that there are some practical applications to using presence and abundance right now in our built environment. Um, so we can talk for a moment just about surveillance as a concept and perhaps it's most well established in the sewage surveillance uh, that is starting to gain some traction on university campuses and with city wastewater municipal, municipalities. Um, and that's really a kind of course level signal of what might be 
in the environment, in, in, in the community, I should say. Um, and you can track that over time. You can look for points of inflection and, and degradation. Um, but that's, you know, in, inherently a pretty aggregated geographic or spatially aggregated signal. And it's laggy. Uh, laggy as in it's a little slower because you breathe every minute, you might use the restroom a few times a day. So um, the idea that you could use a surveillance technique inside of buildings built upon that concept of our wastewater surveillance, I think is really exciting. And with just presence and abundance, let's say you're, we, we know that you can identify the RNA in an air handler, and we've done so and, and published a preprint. Um, and we, we know you can identify the RNA in active air pumps and have done so. Um, so could you establish a regular frequency, regular sample frequency such that you could use uh, points of inflection in that RNA abundance uh, to guide building operations decision making? Or perhaps to determine the effectiveness of biomass removal, if not if not disinfection, where you might break down the viable virus and still leave relic RNA, at least you could look at the effectiveness of biomass removal techniques. Um, but could really, that also be used as an early warning system to say there might be a potential outbreak happening in this building or in this neighborhood? Yeah, that, that's the dream. We just put a video together to try to explain this concept. It's a nice little three minute video. It's on our Institute for Health in the Built Environment website. You can check it out. Um, it's on YouTube as well. But the idea is, can you do that monitoring to prevent potential outbreaks? And uh, I always use the South Korea call center uh, study, which is pretty famous, um, well-researched, you know, after the fact, after the outbreak in that building. Um, and if you look at that, if you know the study, figure one shows the retroactive kind of uh, contact tracing of when people were in that building that had symptoms and where they were in that building. And then they did a map to show what they, what they call the attack rate or spread was. And what's really intriguing about that is the big spike. So there were, there were first a couple of individuals on, I believe, February 22nd and 24th that were symptomatic. And so chances are they were pre-symptomatic, you know, on February 18th or 20th or something like that and putting it into the environment you know, coughing or, or, or not even coughing or sneezing, maybe just breathing into the environment. Um, and then there's a surge about seven days later where about a dozen or so individuals got sick. And then about a week after that, you know, 40, 50, 60 individuals got sick. Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there's basically evidence that there's a wave, a second, a first introduction, a first wave and a second wave before, in that case, they shut the building down. Right. So can we use this technology to prevent and identi identify that first or second individual in the, in the building, maybe asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic? I believe we can and potentially minimize or prevent, hopefully prevent mm -hmm. outbreaks. Again, we are taking questions. So if you're watching us on the live stream and would like to ask a question, just drop it into the comment section and we will try to work it in. We do have another question. Uh, Francisco on Facebook, could you discuss how future land use planning and high density development might be affected by what we're learning about how people can get infected in the indoor environment? David, should I take that one? Yeah, that's all you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, there's a lot of speculation here, obviously. Um, and we were already imagining, I guess, reimagining cities before COVID-19. Um, we have a, a collaborator here and there's, there's other universities working on this that, that are really looking at the way autonomous vehicles, the share, you know, ride share uh, programs and just the sharing economy um, and is shifting the way cities are designed. You know, there's this hypothesis of no more parking lots um, which, uh, and no more parking garages. And so reimagining all of this, there's hypotheses around if it's all autonomous vehicles, then there's this risk of suburban sprawl. Um, and all of this, you know, has impacts on, on energy. And we're living, uh, we've described what we're living in right now with the COVID-19 as a, you know, as a global pandemic. And I'd say we're, we're living in a pandemic inside of a, of a climate crisis as well. 
And so it's really important to figure out ways to create density, uh, to, to have the efficiencies associated with that, while also creating ways to live safely with regards to things like pandemics, which we've seen coming at us in waves. And obviously this is the biggest wave, but it's unlikely that we're going to live in a, in a future where this isn't going to happen again. So we have to find a way to do the both end. Um, you know, you take that to a microcosm level and you think about open office environments and, you know, there's a lot of synergies and, and creativity and innovation that can happen when people can work so closely together, even as simple as overhearing other people's conversations and the interjecting. Um, all of that is at risk because of this concern around coronavirus and these limitations of physical distancing and virtual, virtual environments. Um, so I'm, I'm on a quest to find a way to, to, to do both, to, to reduce and reverse climate change support community development, as well as find ways to live in these spaces um, when we have to flex into pandemic mode, if you will. I'm curious, you know, you're an architect. How did you get interested in microbiology? Oh, just, just pure luck, <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest. Um, I was recruited to University of Oregon to take over a lab um, that was focused on energy efficiency uh, called the Energy Studies and Buildings Lab. And um, it's a really well-known lab and I was super honored to be recruited to it. And um, they just happened to be doing this really interesting partnership with microbiology. And uh, I quickly met David and, and uh, Jonathan Eisen and others inside of this, what we call the Moby community, microbiology, the built environment supported by the Sloan Foundation. Um, and uh, it's been a wild five years for me, but I sure have enjoyed getting to learn more about microbiology. That's great. Are there, are there things that we can do to make indoor spaces safer in terms of spreading viruses? David, you want to hit on the high points of our, uh, of our well, uh, why don't I, why don't I take the, the person part of it and you can take the building part okay, of it. Okay, great. I mean, people ask this question a lot with respect to COVID-19. Uh, and, and it's still the, the biggest transmission risks are the direct person to person. You know, we talk about hand washing, we talk about surfaces or whatever, but really being in a shared space where you share air with a person who is infected, that is your biggest risk. And that risk goes up if you're shouting or singing or whatever, or you're projecting aerosols. I mean, I think that, you know, social engineering is still the best tool we have against the virus. That's step number one. Only after social engineering happens, you know, physical distancing, masks, those sorts of things, then we can start to think about ventilation, sunshine, those sorts of things in buildings. But so that would be my plug is that social engineering first and then building stuff second. So I'll segue to Kevin. That's great. Yeah. I, I, and I completely agree with that. I think, you know, COVID has rocked our economy. Buildings are the engine of our economy. Right now, we're not using this infrastructure in many scenarios, and I think it's costing us. It's costing people jobs. Um, using the infrastructure might cost people li people's lives if we don't do it as safely as possible, but we have to find a way to sort of thread this needle between lives and livelihoods. Um, and if we can implement building engineering and architectural design and building engineering controls, to create safer environments, even without perfect knowledge about the true risk of aerosol or airborne transmission, with per without perfect knowledge about you know, the viability of the RNA that we found in air handlers, um, or, or without perfect knowledge of what the minimum in infective dose is, um, I, I believe we're either going to be implementing these controls and testing our buildings for coronavirus, or we're not gonna be in those buildings. And I don't think the latter is really an option. So there are, there's a series of measures that we can implement and every building is different. Um, minimum outside air fraction is one term that's used. So that's you know in a building's ventilation system and I'll use the word HVAC, which is heating, ventilating and air conditioning. In a building's HVAC system, there's a ventilation component and there is a set amount of minimum fresh air required by code and then there's 
anything upwards of that. And you can potentially have 100% outside air systems um, that it doesn't, they, they don't do any recirculation of room air. Um, so it's surprising, I think, to a lot of people um, in our commercial buildings and believe it or not, even in our hospital environments, um, that there is a great de degree of recirculated air. So you exhale, the, the droplets or aerosols get put into a room, they get sucked out of that room like a vacuum cleaner, um, and they go through this um, HVAC system to, to be filtered and to be mixed with some amount of fresh air. It could be 80 or 85% or sometimes even more recirculated air and only you know, 15, 20% fresh air. And then there are other times where it can be a lot of fresh air. And the limiting factor there is what is the heating and cooling component of that HVAC, right? So if you're 100 degrees in Sacramento uh, and your buildings are 72 degrees indoors, that's a you know, 28 degree delta T. It's a lot, it takes a lot of energy to cool right. down that 100 degree outside air. And your system's cooling capacity might just not be set up to allow you to go up above 20% minimum outside air. And so that's where the rub comes. How much can we turn that dial depends on how much cooling capacity. Right. And it almost sounds like something like that would require a huge investment because a lot of, a lot of these buildings and even newer homes are built uh, to be efficient and to be efficient, you're recirculating a lot of air. You're not letting a lot of the outside air in is my understanding. So are we talking yeah. about just tweaking existing HVAC systems? Or are we talking about basically retrofitting them? Yeah, I'll, I'll say every building has some wiggle room in its system. You can probably, so we talked about outside air fraction. You could, you could probably adjust your outside air fraction a little bit. Um, and especially if it's not, you know, the hottest day in the summer, there's a lot of the year where you may be able to do that. And then there's also what's called air exchange rate, which is how quickly are you turning over that room air. Um, and regardless of the outside air fraction, those are tools that you have at your disposal to, to potentially move more air. And if you're moving more air, you're putting it through the filtration process more, you know, more often and likely removing more of that, you know, particulate matter from the air. Um, and then there's also just the opening the window if you can. Oh have yeah, a window that opens right. And I'm a big I'm a big fan of that. There there are some caveats or concerns, but you know the idea with opening a window is rapidly get you know more outside air into your space. If you go into a space and it feels stuffy, this is a good thing to consider. Um, and then it also bypasses the ductwork and the good the good and the bad of that we've done research to show that when you introduce outside air through a window it's different it shifts the microbial community indoors as opposed to air that's brought through ductwork and that could be because of the filtration process of ductwork or it could be because of the recirculation fraction with ductwork or it could be about perhaps you know what happens in the ductwork over time um but the caveats to opening the window are, well, you don't have that filtration and that might be, you know, bringing in more allergens and that's something we have to be, or, or outdoor pollution, we have to consider those things. And also just opening a window doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna induce the airflow. You have to think about really basic architectural design principles about getting that air to flow. And anybody who's trying to open their, you know, open their house up at night um, knows that it works better if you can get a window on two walls to get the cross flow, uh, or if you can get windows on your first floor and outlet outlet on your second floor to induce the stack flow. Um, so those are some tips and caveats. Right, right, right. I want to move on to schools because, you know, there's been a lot of debate and concern about the possibility of reopening schools this fall. Are there particular things we can do to help schools open in a safe manner? Well, I think what David mentioned is, is most important. And, and we've been, I think I'm spending half of every day in the last several weeks talking with school districts, working on this school's reopen. Um, there's some great resources that were made available by uh, the Harvard Health Program earlier this week or maybe last week. Um, if you go Harvard Health Schools, you'll, you'll find a really nice um, 20 or 30 page document and a really nice one page distillation of these concepts. 
And it's really a systematic approach of thinking through the activities of the school. And so much of it is this human, uh, human work uh, that, you know, the behavioral practices that David mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, all of these same HVAC principles and even testing uh, your buildings uh, are, can be part of a, a safer reopen um, with, with schools coming up this fall. And, you know, and that's just around the corner. In Oregon, we have a little bit of a delay because we don't, we don't start as early as others. Um, but every school district and every school building in Oregon has to have their action plan in by August 15th. And uh, we're working, working hard to help open them if we can. So I want to I say something here, which is I think school reopening really emphasizes how much we don't know about what are, what are actual risks. You know, schools are spending millions of dollars on disinfectant wipes, for example, and, and practices like that. And we actually have no idea if surface to person transmission is any real risk. I mean, we expect that it is. It is for other coronaviruses. It's not been demonstrated with this coronavirus specifically. Um, but because we don't know what the minimum infectious dose is, we don't know how long the particle, the virus stays viable in the air. There's just so much we don't know. So schools are being asked to make complex decisions based on surprisingly incomplete information. So I think it's a really challenging question. And I think this is where the precautionary principle comes in, which is a lot of school districts and states are gonna say, we don't know, so let's not do it. Right, right. Yeah. We have another question from a uh, viewer. Uh, AJ watching on Facebook is asking, are HEPA or UV air filters effective? I wanna just circle back to the last question for a minute, because I think it's so important and the precautionary principle, I think, is totally valid. My, my fear or my concern there is if we can't open schools, we can't reopen. We really re can't reopen the economy. And so pushing, pushing to explore the possibility paired with a, a rapid surveillance program, I think, is the only possibility. And I think we have a month or so to figure that out. Um, maybe even just a couple weeks in some school districts, uh, or I fear we're going to be going through likely the whole year online. And that's hugely detrimental to learning from an equality and equity standpoint. It's also a big concern because in a, from, a, from a school is safe perspective and, and the resources that students get at school, um, it's an incredibly, it's a monumental decision. It's, it's, the, it's the crux of, of this climb is to figure this out. And we don't have a it's lot of time left. Definitely not an ideal situation, but the risks of opening too early are just very, just too great. Yeah, the debate, the debate will go on, I'm sure. And it will play out in many different ways in many different school districts across this country. Right. Okay, what about the filter question? Are HEPA or UV air filters effective against this new coronavirus? David, you wanna jump in on it? Nope, that's all you. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, there's a little bit of a repeat here is we believe that these techniques are effective um, based upon previous research on previous viruses. Um, there are some studies that are coming out. Um, uh, final author Dabish um, published a paper on, on, on sunlight and, and so, you know, UVA and UVB piece of the spectrum. Uh, and its, its effectiveness at reducing um, the viability of uh, the novel coronavirus that came out about a month, month and a half ago, D-A-B-I-S-C-H, uh, final author. And uh, there's other UVC, which uh, UVC doesn't make its way through the atmosphere. And so there's a reason it's effective at, you know, zapping microbes is because they're, they're not accustomed to it um, in the atmosphere uh, and just the energy and breaking, you know, uh, breaking the, the viable shell, the lipid shell apart, et cetera. Um, and there's, there's some research to suggest it's useful for this virus, though as a comparator to other viruses, that's very, very little research. Um, but given the confidence from its effectiveness at other viruses, I think um, it's worth serious consideration. Um, 
And then you get into the question of where do you invest? Okay, then there's HEPA filtration. Again, the same thing. There's just not a lot of data on, on this for SARS-CoV-2, but we can make some inferences from other research. And there's a lot of uh, studies available about the removal rate and the, the efficacy at removing um, viral particles of different sizes. So, uh, or, or particles, particulate matter period of different sizes. So both I think are good strategies to consider. Um, and the question is, how do you start to make investment choices about which? And, um, and really the, the concern that from a manufacturer's perspective, there's the silver bullet mentality. And I think none of these techniques are silver bullets. All of them have limitations. So HEPA filtration works great. We've heard tons about the airline industry and their HEPA filters, right? Um, and they, we talk about even the outside air ratio in the airline industry. Um, but the concern there is the concentration of individuals. Yeah, the, the, the cabin air volume might change over at a really high rate, almost at the rate of a, of a surgery suite. But the fresh air per person is a whole nother, mm. whole nother question. And so that's where these kind of come back and balancing with one another, like occupant density within classrooms and HEPA filtration. Uh, those, those things in combination as a layer, and then maybe some UV disinfection, right? Um, you really want to save that disinfection for when you know there was a problem. Ergo, the surveillance and testing. We don't necessarily want to be using UV every day in a building because it, de it degrades surfaces. And UV air treatment, another great idea, but it requires just like filtration, you know, it requires the well, maybe not just like filtration, but with UVC air treatment, it requires a dose duration. And that may, you know, the first pass of the air may not be inactivating the virus. So there's a lot that we don't know. Uh, right. Okay. We have another question. Uh, Tim on Facebook is asking, is there anything I can do to improve air quality in my cubicle if my building does not have a good HVAC system? Oh, we're dreaming. We're dreaming of ideas right now. Um, in a practical manner, um, I'd say, again, uh, a, a policy on masking, if at all possible. Um, I realize that masking is, there's fatigue. I've spent eight hours in a mask. It's not fun. Um, and so I think the answer is kind of these hybrid approaches um, thinking about occupant density in that space is probably the next most important. Um, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but you, you know, you can't test every person every day for coronavirus, but I'd say you can test your, you know, you could test every building every day or every air handler every day. So if you are going to have a regular occupancy plan inside of buildings, I would strongly encourage um, either surface testing or air testing if possible inside. And then from a practical design standpoint, you know, you could put up some plexiglass toppers on your cubicle potentially to, to minimize some of the larger uh, particulate matter or droplets. But chances are, you know, the real, the, the concern is the long-term exposure and the potential of the aerosols that could move around any sort of cubicle topper. Um, which then gives you, brings you to, well, are you gonna install a HEPA filter right in your cubicle? A little remote HEPA filter, which you could do. Um, we're dreaming of technology that could um, provide micro, micro geographical fresh air, if that mm. makes sense. So cubicle fresh air system, um, where it's a one pass, where you know, either it's a one pass outside air introduction right at the cubicle and quickly exhausted or from a technology development standpoint, we're sort of dreaming of these ways where you could have um, purifiers right inside your desk and have kind of a share, uh, uh, not minimize shared breathing spaces, but that's more on the, on the cutting kind of reading. Right. Research and design. I guess the short answer is basically realistically. No, I would well, say, yeah, I mean, no, oh. <laughs> it's outside of an individual's control. You wanted a short answer. Sorry. <laughs> We have uh, one, another question from uh, a viewer, um, Logos Books, which is a bookstore here um, on Facebook. They're watching booksellers are torn between sanitizing books that customers have handed, handled, but not purchased. Half are sanitizing, half are not. What's a best practice? So we've been asked this before by the UC Davis Library, actually. 
and again, I think no one knows for two reasons. One, well, three reasons. We don't know how long the virus is viable on surfaces. We don't know, even if it is viable, what the transmission risk back to people is. And we don't know, again, what the minimum infectious dose is. So it may be that there are virus particles on those books. They may be dead, but even if they're alive, they may not represent enough to actually get someone sick. I mean, all of the evidence so far is, again, that the risk is person to person inhaling aerosols or droplets that are emitted by people in a shared space. So personally, I think that objects don't represent nearly as much risk as, as sharing space, but we don't really know that. So I think there's no good answer, unfortunately. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add, you know, there's everything David said and then there's, well, what are you going to do? Because you have to decide. So are you going to spray down and wash down these books every day? Uh, I would say there's an acute problem that you could be avoiding, um, which is super important right now. But long term as a practice, this is something we want to be really careful of because it's just overuse of disinfectants, I think, is a, is a concern. So maybe there's a middle ground, which is you set those books aside for two days before you reshelve them. If that's a if that's a viable solution um, to for a good for a good number of the books, maybe you're disinfecting far fewer, um, which could be a step in the right direction. We're going to need to wrap up uh, for time in just a little bit. Of, I, I wanted to wrap up by asking you guys: Do you do either of you foresee building designs changing over the next few years because of this pandemic? Are we going to see kind of like the open floor plan go away, or will there be other innovations or practices in designing and create, you know, building new buildings because of this? That's you. Uh, well, I think the answer is absolutely. Um, I don't believe that we will quickly forget this. Um, I said that even in April and I'll even more so now, um, just we're in this prolonged first wave or second wave or whatever. And I think we're going to see this again in fall, even if it subsides, we'll see it, we'll see it come up again in fall, given, you know, what we know in history about infection and um, epidemiology. So I don't think we're quickly forgetting this. And I think it will, it's already shaping how we're operating, we're, we're already making retrofits. Uh, and it's uh, in the, the, the designs that are on the board that we consult, uh, it's, it's already shifting the conversation. So I think absolutely. And if, if the 1918 pandemic is any clue, uh, we spent two to three decades as, uh, as a profession um, un understanding the implications and looking for ways to create healthier spaces. And I, I do think we're on a, on a multi-decade um, reaction to what we're living with right now. Well, this has been really interesting and so helpful to, to learn about your work. Thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your knowledge and your research. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. David Coyle is a project scientist working at the UC Davis Gen Genome Center. Kevin Vanden Weiland by Mellenberg is an associate professor at the University of Oregon and co-director of the Biology and the Built Environment Center. Every other week, we're hearing from researchers across the UC Davis campuses who are working on vaccines, therapies, medical devices, tracking the virus, and looking for solutions in unexpected places. Next time, we'll be looking into how to manage kids' stress and anxiety around the new school year, including kids with special needs. Until then, I'm Satirius Johnston, and this is UC Davis Live COVID-19.